So once you recognize that in your head that it's just a silly word for opportunity, then you will be a game changer as well. So. In the months following my diagnosis, I was 21 years old and my short-term memory became really altered. Um, there were just gaps of time in the day where I, it would just be a blank space. And although um, school became more difficult, I tried to combat that, so I started getting these little pocket-sized journals. And in these journals, I would just write down everything. To-do list, conversations, who I was talking to, where the conversation took place, because when people came up later and were like, hey, you know, remember this happened? I'm like, uh, no. So um, within one of these journals, I wrote, it was on the second page, I went back to look through them to prepare for this talk, and um, it wrote, I wrote, death is inevitable and living is not. So today I'm here to tell you guys my crooked journey and um, give you the story behind when I decided that existence was no longer an option for me, but I decided I was going to actually live. Um, so the human life is linear. We can't do redos, we can't go in reverse. It's all moving forward. And when I think about that, I can see ticks. And on those ticks, I believe they're impactful moments. So some are big, some are small, but throughout that line, you'll, you'll find impactful moments. And um, so I'm going to share with you guys my ticks. So boom, the first one, birth, obviously. <laughs> Highly anticipated event and impactful because you guys wouldn't know so much about me <laughs> if that hadn't happened. And since the mics did that, so now you guys know even more. Um, two, uh, that's my family. It was years ago we were hiking in Yosemite, but the two people I'm here to talk about are uh, the adult female and male. Those are my parents, and they are the most successful people I know. A lot of times you think, man, why is she talking about you know her parents' bank accounts? But that's actually the furthest thing from it. Um, we grew up in a situation where I wouldn't say we were financially abundant, but I was completely provided for. And, and I actually remember... Um, at one point, there were four of us. It was before the little one, who actually goes to IMG now, Becca, was born. And we were living in an RV. And my parents decided for us to park in this campground. So for like three months, six months, we were living in a campground in Encinitas, California, on this cliff overlooking the ocean. And, uh, and like, it's just silly stuff. Like, I remember having to pay a quarter to take a shower at the campground. And I remember riding our bikes. And I remember waking up in the morning to go to, like, kindergarten and just seeing like dolphins swim by and just just being so um, amazed and you know when I'm just a little kid I'm just in awe and and I wouldn't trade my childhood at all because it was because of those two that um, I learned two incredible virtues I learned gratitude and humility so the next one I don't have a slide for so you guys can just keep looking at my adorable family um, tick when I was in sixth grade I granted my first make-a-wish so, um, living in Memphis, Tennessee at the time, I had done a lot of work with uh, St. Jude. However, this was the first time I'd ever engaged with a child living in, in the pediatric medical setting. And I just became obsessively passionate about this field. So pretty much every decision I made from that point on was based on a way for me to get back there, to get back to this child, to, to help this, these children. However, soccer obviously took precedence for a bit there. Um, tick. I'm now a junior in college, and I had the opportunity to go to South America and do my two favorite things, help people and play soccer. So we were down in Bolivia, and, and these girls, these are just a couple of the girls we worked with, but our focus was using soccer to combat gender inequality. We were using a sport for these girls to know their true self-worth. And um, it was in this month that I was there that I learned that the true value of our human existence is defined by our interaction amongst one another. Tick. Um, I returned to the States and was extremely ill. I had my gallbladder emergently removed, and I was in and out of the hospital for the next nine months um, with a, my colon that had um, stopped functioning. So pretty much I was this 
incredible athlete. <laughs> um, I had been an IMG, I had played at the highest collegiate level, and now I wasn't allowed to move at a pace faster than a walk because when circulation was pumping too much, um, my colon would expand and it would just cause issues. Tick. During the same time, the woman in the middle, my mother, got very ill as well. So now I'm just asking why. Why am I sick? Why is my mom getting sick? Um, ultimately, we found out that she had 10 pounds of tumors in her reproductive system. So we're both in and out of the hospital. And, uh, and I began really trying to search for reasons. And this is when I really dove into scripture. And um, I had grown up in a Christian household, but I wouldn't say that I was extremely studied. So I was just looking for answers. And um, in that time, I read this incredible quote by C.S. Lewis. And he was describing grief because honestly, when my mom got sick, when I got sick, I wasn't angry. I was grieving. And he described it as a cycle going round and round. And what was incredible about the quote is he later stated, if I am going in circles, dare I hope I'm in a spiral. And if I'm in a spiral, am I going down or am I going up? So around this time I made the decision that my grief was going to spiral me up. Tick. Um, leading into my preseason of my senior year, my redshirted senior year, uh, they found an aneurysm in my brain. It, had, it wasn't ruptured, it still isn't, I'm still living with it. It's in the central part of my brain behind my left eye. And um, after, that was actually taken after a Navy SEAL training camp. Our coaches decided to do some team bonding and bring in active duty Navy SEALs for a six hour boot camp. In the fifth hour I developed a really bad headache and the left side of my face started to droop. Uh, the following day I was admitted into the stroke unit at Tampa General Hospital. Um, I was 21 years old and they thought I had suffered a mild stroke. At the time the diagnostic testing was inconclusive but later my neurosurgeon explained that he did still think it had happened but it's still up in the air so fingers crossed it didn't happen. Um, tick. Two years later, this is pretty much the image, or two weeks later, this would be the image that became my next two years. I was diagnosed with myasthenia gravis. It's a neuromuscular autoimmune disease, similar to MS. It's under the umbrella of muscular dystrophy. Pretty much what happens is, um, with any sort of heat, exhaustion, uh, stress, lack of sleep, change in the weather, if I eat something funny, um, I experience severe muscle weakness. It starts in my left eye, but it'll affect any part of the body that I'm using to the point of paralysis. So the two photos on the bottom, I'm actually unable to move anything on my body except for my neck and my smile. Um, and ice actually helps with that, but unfortunately what makes MG life-threatening is the fact that it also affects my lungs. So um, when your diaphragm becomes impacted, you can, you can be put in a severe situation. So in this time, what you may have seen also in that journal was another quote that really stuck with me when I got sick. It was that if I spend all of my time focusing on my future losses, you know, because after this point I had no athleticism. I'll blind myself from my daily victories. And I really dove into the word after that. I became a Christian and, and the Lord truly was the reason I was capable to go back on the field after my diagnosis. I spent the next two years as a captain at USF and um, was able to offer valuable minutes. It would be about 15 minutes here and then I'd come off be iced down and then I go in for about five to ten minutes in the second half, come off and be carted to the training room for the next like hour and a half until I was able to move my body again. Um, so tick, all of this led to I am more. That's the foundation that myself and another IMG alum, John Ryan Murphy, you can see him here but also on your way out you'll see him on the wall. Um, <laughs> he was my best friend from IMG and I went to him with this idea, this idea that we could do for others what USF did for me, whereas even though I was sick, even though um, I was this new person outside of athletics and I wasn't going to be the same person again, I could still build my identity in what I was passionate about. 
and that could keep, keep me healthier longer. So that's what we do for children. Um, we work with children and we facilitate opportunities so their passion can be built, or so their identity can be built in their passion and not their medical diagnosis. So um, in closing, I guess I just have one request for you guys. I ask for you to ingrain generosity in your life. It'll make all the difference. So whoever you are, whatever you're going through, submit to that and submit to the fact that that is why you are here on this earth and that is the impact you're going to leave on this earth. Um, and then also, I want you to recognize that all these people I've shared with you, my parents, um, anyone who was involved in any of those ticks, those are my impactful moments. And you guys have an opportunity to be impactful moments in the lives of others as well. So embrace that and encourage it. Um, when I was, when I had just been diagnosed with aneurysm, but I hadn't yet been diagnosed with MG, I was in the office of my neurosurgeon. And I asked him if I could play soccer again. I said, would I ever be able to play again? Can I be on the field again? And his answer, which is like literally just like ingrained in my mind was, your risk of dying is the same on the soccer field as walking down the street. So we want you to live as normal life as possible. And I decided normal wasn't going to be enough. I was going to live a grand life. I was going to live a remarkable life. So the critical question I ask you is what is important in your life? The quantity of years in your existence or the quality within those years that you possess? Because to me, to live a remarkable life is to live and die for a purpose that's far greater than my own. So as I continue to move forward on this line, as time passes and as my life lengthens, right? <laughs> um, I will look back on my joy, I'll look back on my pain, on the suffering, and I'll be completely certain that God's purpose on my life was to leave this world a better place. Thank you. <laughs>